Good evening, good evening, and I'm so sorry we're late. Noam Chomsky's plane did make it from Boston. Hallelujah. I really could not have stepped into his shoes. I did have someone in the audience who would have, but thankfully Noam Chomsky is here. Now, my name is Paul Holengraber, and I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the New York Public Library, known as Live from the New York Public Library. My goal, as all of you know, is to make the lions roar, to make a heavy institution dance, and when successful, to make it levitate as it may, I hope, tonight. I've always wondered how much this building weighs, and nobody in all these years, a decade I've been here, has been able to tell me. Now, let me just quickly mention some of the upcoming events, which include, not on your program, actor Matt Dillon, who will be joining magnum photographer extra extraordinaire Bruce Davidson on May 4th. Our next event will be with Chris Hedges and Seymour Hirsch on May 3rd. The week of June 12th, we will end the season with three punches. This year's Nobel Prize winner, Svetlana Alexievich, will be joined by Pulitzer Prize winner, Catherine Boo, and journalist, Masha Gessen. That is on June 13th. June 14th, Walter Mosley will join Karim Abdul-Jabbar. They will talk, of course, about basketball, but also will discuss their passion for de detective fiction and much else. And to cap the season, I will be holding a conversation with a very great musician and now also filmmaker, Laurie Anderson. That is on June 16th. And in case you were wondering what might be happening between now and then, let me just mention that tomorrow we will have the great honor to welcome on this very stage, Dame Helen Mirren, to talk about everything from Shakespeare. As many of you probably know, the man died 400 years ago yesterday, I'm told. And we will talk about Shakespeare, but we will also talk about her great passion for Peter Brook, a passion I share, who is still alive and 90 years old and very well. Now, tonight, you probably know why you are here. Um, I'm hoping for a true exchange between two extraordinary people. Now, Yanis Varoufakis, after the event and after a Q&A, now, I'd like to say a quick word about Q&A. A microphone will be put right in front of the stage. I love the fact that some people are looking right there. A microphone will be put right there. You will queue up and you will ask intelligent questions, <laughs> and they will not last longer than 52 seconds. I've actually determined that questions can be asked in 52 seconds or less. So you can't make a statement, but you can ask a question. Keep it short, keep it to the point. Yanis Varoufakis, at the end of that Q&A, will sign his new book, and the weak suffer what they must, with a question mark. So come up and have the book signed after purchasing it from our independent bookstore, bookseller, 192 Books. Now, I would like to say a big thank you to the Ford Foundation for their fantastic support to live from the New York Public Library, as well as their, as their support to many other cultural institutions across New York City. Thanks also go to the continuing generosity of Celeste Bartos, and always to Manaz and Adam Bartos. Now, for the last seven or so years, I've asked my guests to give me a biography of themselves in seven words a haiku of sorts, or if you're very modern, a tweet. <laughs> Chomsky was recalcitrant, <laughs> which in, literally in Latin means kicking back. Um, he hesitated. I really, really, really had to push him. And 
his seven words reminded me of the seven words that Werner Herzog gave me. Werner Herzog, when I asked him for seven words, he didn't quite know what the point was, and he said, filmmaker, no, he wrote, Werner Herzog, colon, filmmaker originated in Zachang, Bavaria. <laughs> now, Noam Chomsky, in case you were wondering, linguistics and philosophy professor at MIT, comma, author. <laughs> That's a biography. Yanis Varoufakis gave me a biography that, that doesn't resemble Werner Herzog's or Noam Chomsky's. Yanis Varoufakis, dedicated to subverting dominant paradigms, economic and political. Please welcome them. <laughs>we don't have anyone to introduce us so um, I've been asked to kick off okay. uh, by saying firstly that um, is this wonderful that we're all here just to subvert the notion that nothing good can come out of the public sector <laughs> <laughs> no well the fact that I'm here barely actually uh, has a relationship to that comment. Uh, I came from Boston, my wife and I came from Boston, took seven hours, uh, and any society that hasn't been smashed by neoliberal policies of the kind you describe, it would have taken maybe an hour and a half, <laughs> two hours. <laughs> Uh, there is a train, the pride of the public sector, uh, which uh, I, I took for the first time in 1950, and it's about 15 minutes faster now than it was then, <laughs> when it makes the schedule, which is a chancy situation. So we decided to come by airplane and spent most of the afternoon on the runway. <laughs> <laughs> Well, no. what shall we talk about? Well, we can talk about uh, the neoliberal assault on the world's population in the last generation, which you've written so brilliantly about. What strikes me, you know, given the, the last quite uh, eventful year of my life, what really strikes me is the major disconnect between the philosophy and ideology of neoliberalism, and that which I encountered when negotiating, in inverted commas negotiating, when being dictated by, dictated by the great and the good of the neoliberal international financial establishment. Um, now, think about it. If, if, you, if you take the great libertarians, the great neoliberals, who castigate all tax-funded activities, and you consider the reason why I'm here today, and I'm not the, still the Minister of Finance of Greece. Why? It's because I refuse another hundred billion smackers, dollars, uh, of a tax-backed loan to my insolvent government, uh, which the creditors insisted that I should take. The three yeah. nines. It's astonishing. So here it is. 
So here, so here you have the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and the European Commission insisting that our bankrupt state takes on another 100 billion under conditions that guarantee that we will not be able to repay the taxpayers of Europe that will be granting us that money. And that comes from neoliberals, who supposedly are against all tax-funded loans to government, and who supposedly believe that uh, an insolvent entity doesn't have the moral right to take on more, more loans. But as you point out, uh, what is it, 90% of those loans go to French and German bankers. That was the first loan. This loan, it would go from the one pocket of the creditors to another pocket of the creditors, uh -huh. so that they would maintain the pretense that Greece was not bankrupt. But effectively, what I'm trying to say is the intense hypocrisy of the neoliberal establishment, which is not really even interested in uh, uh, sticking to its own neoliberal ideology. This is just 19th century power politics of crushing anyone who dares stand up to them and say a simple word, no. But I, th I think that's actually traditional. Uh, one of the uh, uh, paradoxes of neoliberalism is that it's not new and it's not liberal. Exactly. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, exactly. if you look at uh, uh, what you describe is a form of hip hypocrisy, but the same is true of saying that uh, uh, we should not support uh, tax-funded institutions. Uh, the financial sector is basically tax-funded. Of course. Uh, you recall the IMF study of the uh, leading American banks, which determined that virtually all their profits come from their implicit government insurance policy, cheap credit, uh, access to higher credit ratings, uh, incentives to take risky transactions, which are profitable, but then if it's problematic, you guys pay for it. Uh, or just take uh, the basis of the contemporary economy, which actually I've been privileged to see developing in government-subsidized uh, laboratories for decades. Uh, MIT, where I've been since the 1950s, is one of the uh, institutions where uh, the government, the funnel in the early days was the Pentagon, was pouring in money to create uh, the basis for the high-tech economy of the future and the profit-making of the institutions that are regarded as private enterprises. It was decades of work under public funding with a very anti-capitalist ideology. So according to capitalist principles, if someone invests in a risky enterprise over a long period, and 30 years later it makes some profit, they're supposed to get part of the profit, but it doesn't work like that here. It was the taxpayer who invested for decades. Uh, the profit goes to uh, Apple and Microsoft, not, In, not to the taxpayer. Indeed, if you take an iPhone apart, every single technology in it was developed by some government grant. And for every long single one. And for long and some period. of them by government grants from other countries. Yeah. like Wi-Fi from the Australian and Commonwealth. It's, it's, yeah. it's, you, you see an interesting uh, picture of it from a place like MIT or other major research institutions. So if you walked around uh, the, off the building where I work uh, uh, 50 years ago, uh, you would have seen uh, electronic firms, uh, Raytheon, uh, iTech, others, uh, IBM, uh, 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 there to essentially uh, uh, rob the technology that's being developed at public expense and seeing if they can uh, turn it into something applicable for profits. You walk around the institution today, you see different buildings. You see Novartis, uh, Pfizer, uh, pharmaceutical, big pharmaceutical cor corporations. Why? Because the cutting edge of the economy has shifted from electronics-based to biology-based. So therefore, uh, the uh, predators in the so-called private sector are there to see what they can pick up from the 
taxpayer-funded research uh, in the in fundamental uh, biological sciences. And uh, that's called free enterprise and a free market system. So speak of hypocrisy, it's pretty hard to go beyond that. <laughs> Quite right. This hypocrisy is fundamental to the whole enterprise culture of uh, uh, capitalism from, from the 250 beginning. years ago. Yeah. I mean, the whole notion that uh, um, there can be a market system which is um, at an arm's length separated from a state which is the enemy is um, the sickest joke in the history of humankind. If you think that, uh, I mean, this, this narrative of uh, private crea wealth creation, which is appropriated by the big, big bad wolf, the state, on behalf of trades unions and the working class that need this, a social, social welfare net, is just a preposterous reversal of the truth, uh, that wealth is being created collectively and appropriated privately. But right from the beginning, I mean, the enclosures in Britain would right. never have happened without the king's army. That's and without true. state brutality for pushing peasants off the, uh, the, the, their ancestors' uh, land and pro creating the commodification the of labor, the commodification of land, which then gave to the rise to capitalism. Just half an hour ago, we were being shown, some of us, the magnificent collection of maps of the city of New York in this wonderful building. And you could see in one of the maps of Alabama the precise depiction of the theft of land from Native Americans, the way in, it was, it, in which it was parceled up, commodified. Now, that would never have happened without the brutal intervention of uh, the state, and which just... created uh, the, the, the process of uh, privatization of land and therefore of commodification. Actually, one of my favorite uh, passages from Adam Smith is where he gives advice to the new colonies, to newly liberated colonies, as uh, to how they should pursue sound economics, which is pretty much what the IMF tells the third world today. Uh, what he said is the advice was uh, you should uh, concentrate on what was later called comparative advantage, uh, produce agricultural products, you're good at that, uh, export furs, uh, fish, and so on, but don't try to produce manufacturing goods because Britain, England, has superior manufacturing goods. So therefore, you should import them from England. They're good at that. You're good at uh, cotton and corn. Incidentally, the cotton was hardly by free enterprise. Uh, but, uh, and you should certainly not try to monopolize uh, the resources that you have. And, if you pursue those uh, 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 practices, then everybody will be better off. Economic theory proves that. Well, uh, the United States happened to be free of English control, so therefore they were able to do the opposite, just as England had done. Uh, high tariffs to block British goods, uh, enabled them to create a textile industry, the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, uh, later in the century a steel industry, blocking superior British steel, uh, uh, and right up to the present, as I've mentioned, with high tech. As far as monopolization is concerned, the US made a major effort to monopolize the basic resource for the early Industrial Revolution, namely cotton. That's the oil of the 19th century. And the U.S. had most of it, not all of it. And the conquest of uh, Mexico, which was not exactly by free enterprise, uh, was largely undertaken to try to, contain, uh, to develop, gain a monopoly of cotton, uh, which would overcome the major enemy in those days, which was Britain. Britain was the big force, the enemy. And the, 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 uh, 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 the Jacksonian presidents, Tyler, Peirce, mid-19th century, uh, uh, their position was that if we could monopolize cotton, we could bring England to our feet. That way we could really defeat them. They didn't quite make it, but made a lot. Uh, incidentally, that uh, 
effort was what Saddam Hussein was charged with in 1990. The charge was ludicrous, but the charge was he was going to try to monopolize oil and bring us all to his feet, which was crazy. But the U.S. did try to monopolize cotton, and that's part of the way in which uh, power shifted from England to the United States. Uh, and that, I think that's a pretty good record of the way sound economics has worked over the years. There have been places where sound economics was applied, liberal policies. It's called the third world. Uh, and there's no, it's not an accident. You take a look at the global south, one country uh, developed, Japan, the one country that was not colonized. Uh, take a look at East Asia, the tigers of East Asia. One exception, the one that was conquered by the United States uh, 1898 with a couple hundred thousand people killed and stays semi-colonized, not part of the uh, Asian tiger uh, uh, explosion of industrialization. The pattern is just uniform, mm -hmm. but uh, somehow hasn't entered economic theory. Wonder why. You're an economist. <laughs> well, <laughs> the reason why it never entered economic theory was because economics in universities um, was began to evolve from the 1950s onwards as uh, the queen of the social sciences. And what gave discursive power and monopoly power within the academic environment to economics was the claim that it was the only social theory uh, which um, was peddling um, universal truths to be proven by mathematical means. Uh, and, and, and it succeeded. So when a, a sociologist, an anthropologist, and an economist applied for a grant, it was always the economist who got it on the basis of this discursive monopoly. And, however, in order to close the model mathematically, uh, the only way to solve the equations is by making assumptions that distance the model from really existing capitalism. So, for instance, you have to assume that there's no time and there's no space. Because if you allow time to interfere with your model or space to enter, you end up with indeterminacy. In other words, you end up with a system of equations that cannot be solved or that have an infinity of possible solutions and then you have no what predictive power. Yeah. You can't say, well, this is what's going to happen. So, you, you have a very interesting inverse Darwinian process. The more successful economists were at creating models that said precisely nothing about capitalism, the greater their success in the academy. So, it, they became the opposite of the public intellectuals that you've been writing about. Uh, they, 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 they create wonderful abstractions, aesthetically pleasing models that I spent quite a few years studying in the same way that you go to a museum and you look at a piece of abstract art, but you don't expect to find the truth of capitalism in its form. So this is the, the interesting sociology of knowledge within the, the economics uh, uh, profession. But then there is a parallel shift, the end of Bretton Woods, which unleashed banking. Remember, um, Roosevelt, uh, made sure that in the Bretton Woods Conference, which designed the post-war, war, the first post-war phase between the 1940s and 1971, 1973, uh, he, had st he had stipulated that one kind of person should, ne should not be allowed into the Bretton Woods Conference. You know who, who these people were. Bankers. <laughs> not one banker attended the Bretton Woods Conference. And that was at the explicit order of uh, FDR. And, it and, and so you had boring banks between 1944 and 1971. But after 1971, and we can discuss why that is, suddenly banking was unleashed and their capacity effectively to mint private money became unlimited and essential to the second post-war phase of global capitalism, of American capitalism, of American hegemony. Uh, during this unleashing, there was a need for uh, a theoretical and ideological cover. So, I don't blame my fellow economists for pulling the trigger 
that uh, created so much devastation in 2008 and before that and after that, but I blame them for providing the economic, the mathematical models, the sermons, which steadied the hand of the financiers uh, and allowed them to believe that what they were doing was perfectly okay, consistent with science, provable mathematically that it was uh, riskless, and therefore uh, allowed them the mental and emotional uh, strength to do a lot more damage than they would have done otherwise. Actually, one of the more interesting uh, uh, moments in the history of uh, science and scholarship was actually in 2008. Uh, for, as you know, for decades, economists had been uh, claiming with extreme arrogance that the, uh, the, uh, they completely understood how to control and manage an economy. There were fundamental principles like the efficient market hypothesis, uh, rational expectations, uh, and uh, anyone who didn't accept this was dismissed as a kind of a, some strange kind of moron. The whole system collapsed. The whole intellectual edifice collapsed in a most amazing fashion and had no effect on the profession. Not, none at all. This is that, well, it did have. It, it had the effect that um, sometimes, you know, when, when we're driving on a freeway, and I usually go well above the speed limit, condemn if you will, uh, and I get stopped by uh, the police, uh, for the next 20 minutes I drive below the, the speed limit, but it doesn't <laughs> last more than 20 minutes. Then, I, after a while, I just go back to where I was. This is exactly like the economics profession. They had a brief moment of... Uh, some did, but... Some, some. And, and or at least of being a bit humble and staying, you know, keeping their heads under the parapet for a bit. But then within 20 minutes, they forgot about right. it, and they carried on teaching the same rubbish to their students. But what is interesting, Noam, is that two, two, two small points. It's not that the economists went headlong into this uh, mathematized religion, because that's what it is. It's a religion with equations and with a bit of bad statistics. What happened was two things. Firstly, there was a kind of ethnic cleansing of anybody that had retained their wits about the economy. So there were economists who uh, challenged this view and who were simply not reproduced by the system. They never got the grants, they never got the PhD students, their PhD students never got lectureships, never got assistant, uh, assistant, assistant professorships. So there was a purge of the stuff. The second, which is a, a, a far more interesting phenomenon, is that the wonderful minds that created the general equilibrium models, the, you know, the, the highest, the popes of the Catholic Church, right, were not believers. So take, for instance, Canaro. Canaro is, you know, and Gerard de Bray. They are the ones that established, John Nash, they established the mathematical theorems uh, upon which all this hypocrisy is based. Now, these people, Canaro, I remember in, in the early 1990s, he was giving a, a talk at NYU. And there were about 20 people. It was a highly mathematized uh, paper. Um, okay, so he, he was enthusiastically going through the equations, and one of the professors there interrupted him at some point and said, Professor Arrow, uh, equation 3.3 reminds me of the argument in favor of this kind of tax as opposed to that kind of tax. And Ken, Ken stopped him immediately and said, uh, my dear boy, he was a bit condescending, I think rightly so, he said, you're confusing that which is interesting with that which is useful. This is interesting. <laughs> if you try to apply to anything real, yeah, it's dangerous. True. So the gurus, the popes, understood that this theory uh, was examining a post-capitalist world, a world without labor markets, without the, the, you know, labor exploitation, uh, without monopolies, without even the slightest of capacities to alter prices on the behalf of, uh, of employers, of entrepreneurs, of conglomerates, a world without firms. Because what, are, what is a company? A company is a market-free zone. It's a hierarchy. It's a, li a little, small Soviet Union with Gosplan and central planning. If you look at Google, if but, you look at Microsoft, that's what it you, is. Then you have Coase's theorem. That's a big help. Yes, <laughs> yes. But the Coase's theorem is taught for five seconds yeah. and then forgotten. Yeah. Yeah. In order to 
to, to make them feel that they've said something about the reason why firms exist. Yeah. But then in those models that produce the macroeconomic policies that were applied even under Clinton, especially yeah. under Clinton, um, there are no firms. There's no time, no firms, no space. Everybody resides on the same point in space so that there are no costs of transport or anything like that. Uh, so imagine a world in which economic policy is... Uh, predicated upon models that assume there is no time, space, firms, profit, or economic rent. Or monopolies. Hi. It's time to get really scared. You know, there's a question that uh, I'm sure you know the answer to from your own experience, which has kind of puzzled me about contemporary economists. It has to do with the IMF and, and your experience as Greek finance minister. From what I can see from the outside, it looked as if the... IMF economists were pretty harshly criticizing the uh, austerity policies of the Troika. Of course. But the IMF itself was strongly supporting them. So what was going on in there? Well, this is exactly what was what, what, what was happening and is happening to this very moment. WikiLeaks uh, leaked a wonderful conversation between my old friend Paul Thompson, who made his name by crushing the Greek economy and then, as a result, being promoted to IMF chief in Europe. <laughs> and his success, successor, a, a Romanian lady, going by the name of Delia Velculescu. Just read this exchange. Just read it. It came out a few weeks ago. WikiLeaks, go and look at it. It's fantastic. Because they're telling the truth. And they're telling exactly what you're saying. They are admitting uh, that which they, you know, Paul Thompson and I have had, had this conversation. First time I met the IMF's chief in Europe was um, in a hotel in Paris, and I was elected uh, with a mandate to negotiate a debt write-down for the Greek debt against the troika of lenders, against the wishes of the creditors. But at the same time, because I had a mandate to negotiate, not to clash with the creditors, I, would, I was prepared to clash if I had to, but I, my, my intention was not to clash. My intention was to come to an honorable agreement between us. Uh, so, because I knew that the German government had a very serious political problem going to the federal uh, parliament in Berlin, to the Bundestag, and admitting that the money they had given to the Greeks was not money to the Greeks for the Greeks, but money for Deutsche Bank, yeah. and therefore they, they were never really expecting to get it back. So this is why we're going to give the Greeks a, a debt restructure. That's what M Mrs. Merkel should have said to the Bundestag, but of course this is not something she could have said and remained the Chancellor of Germany. So I knew that the Germans had a political problem admitting to what they had done uh, in, the, in, in the sense of having given money to the Greeks so that effectively the German taxpayer and the Slovak taxpayer, because they spread the risk like good financiers do to the other Europeans, effectively they were bailing, uh, bailing out their banks a second time in 12 months. So, I, b b so, of course, I knew that, and I was trying to find a formula that would allow our debt to become more manageable and less toxic for the Greek people, while at the same time achieving a kind of political arrangement with Berlin that would make it palatable for them to say yes to it. So, I, uh, first meeting with Paul Thompson, I come to him with a proposal for uh, the kind of debt swaps, financial engineering, that Wall Street is very good at. Mm -hmm. uh, not the kind of thing that one expects from a left-wing minister of finance, but yeah. I wanted to make things work at that point, not so much to go and clash with them. And you know what he said? Oh, this is, this is, this is too mild. We need to take a large chunk of your debt and write it off immediately. I said, well, that's music to my ear, Paul. How are you going to convince Wolfgang Schäuble to do this? Oh, I said, well, that's a problem, you know. But we'll find a way. So at this level, of bilateral discussions, even with the leadership of the IMF, you got the idea that they understood what they had done. They knew that they had done a nasty deed. They, they were subterfuging what they had done. There was a bailout for banks presented as solidarity to a suffering nation. Uh, and they were trying to do something about it. But then, when it came to the final settlement, as creditors, they stuck to one another. They remained loyal to one another. They spread the rumor that our government was putting forward uh, impossible demands, that we didn't want to reform, that we had no proposals. 
We, we came to them with financial engineering proposals from Wall, Wall Street. They had nothing to suggest except for uh, these signals that they were emitting. But I think the most important um, discussion I had was, was, was with somebody really high up in the, in the IMF. The name will not be mentioned. Higher up than Paul Thompson, you can imagine. <laughs> After 10 hours of negotiations, when we got into the nitty-gritty, these extremely boring meetings with uh, aides, with advisors, with experts, with com committee on pensions and another committee on VAT, and other in the end, we ended up together and we had a discussion, confidential discussion, tete a tete. And I heard the following words. Yanis, of course you're right. These policies we're trying to impose upon you can't work. I thought, oh no. You know, deep down, I don't know whether you have this. You probably don't. <laughs> you're Noam Chomsky, you wouldn't. But I'm, I'm less experienced. In, in, in this game of clashing with powers that be at that level. And deep down, I think if I'm, I psychanalyze myself, I really wanted to, to think that the adults know what they're doing. And that I'm the child that is recalcitrant and kicking and screaming. But deep down, the adults, you know, the, the people in power at the top of the IMF know what they're doing. And my complaints and protestations, maybe they're not, not completely accurate. Maybe they, they know more than I think they do. But when these people turn around to me and say, you're right, it can't work. What we are trying to impose upon your nation can't work. But, Yanis, you must understand, we have invested so much political capital in this program. We can't go back. And your credibility, my credibility, depends on accepting it. I think that answers your question. Well, how do they... Uh how do the, the participants in the Troika deliberations react to the uh, technical papers that are coming out from the IMF economists uh, saying their own e economists, uh, Blanchard, others, saying that these policies of austerity under recession are just destructive? It's very simple. They ignore them. What, what are they in saying? The Eurogroup, in the Eurogroup. These were never mentioned. I mentioned them. But I the, but quoted chapter and verse from their own statisticians and economists, like Olivier Blanchard and those yeah. people. I quote. There was also so a remarkable it, study from the IMF showing that the liberalization of labor markets, the removal of protection of labor, of trade union protection, of trade union rights, um, protection from unfair dismissal and all that, that that, in the end, is counterproductive when it comes to competitiveness and productivity. The IMF came out with this in the spring of 2014. A beautiful report. It could have been written by a progressive economist from what, New what School, exactly right? Did it, what exactly did it conclude? But what did it conclude exactly? It concluded that these labor market reforms that the IMF had been pushing down mm. the throat of countries from Africa to yep. Asia to Europe, they don't work. They do not enhance competitiveness, mm -hmm. especially when investment is subdued, which was always my argument. So I quoted that as well in the Europe. I might have been singing the national anthem of Sweden. Yeah. <laughs> it was exactly the same thing, because you've got to understand that these meetings are quite brutal. They have already decided what they're going to do. The ministers are treated like vermin by their own minders and by the representatives of the Troika. Um, something that very few people know is that the Eurogroup is actually led by the Troika, not by the finance ministers, the elected representatives of the nations. So you've got the head of the Eurogroup, who is usually, let's face it, appointed by Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble. Uh, then next to him, there is the real ruler of the European Union, a gentleman called Thomas Wieser. Nobody has heard of him. No, but a, he wields the real power. He what, tells... What is his position? He's um, the head of the Euro Working Group, which is a cabinet uh, yes. under the, 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 the Euro Group. The, non -ex the non-existent group. Oh, yes, it, they, they are the shadow cabinet of the non-existent Euro Group. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and this gentleman has been around now, now how for years. They, how does the Euro Group get established? You don't discuss this in your book. You just say it's there. Um, I, I, I think it just sprung out. <laughs> yeah. you know, out, out, out of the shell, like you know, Aphrodite in Cyprus. <laughs> um, 
Look, when, 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 when we created, in our infinite wisdom, a common currency, and we had a common uh, central bank, but without a state to correspond to the central bank, and went up with states that didn't have a central bank, because that common central bank was created on the proviso that it would not come to the assistance ever of any of the states of which it would be the central bank. Right. Um, they decided that, well, every now and then, the finance ministers of these nations that now don't have a central bank, but they have created a common central bank, should get together and discuss economic policy to coordinate. So this is how it emerged. It's not in any treaty. And I, do you know how I found that out? So the Eurogroup consists of the finance ministers? Yes, well, that, that was the initial idea. Mm -hmm. The finance ministers, and one of them chairs it. Before Dieselblum, who is now the president, it was um, the head of the largest tax haven uh, in the world, Luxembourg, a certain uh, Jean-Claude Juncker. The United States is getting close. Not, not as badly as Luxembourg. Yeah. Not as badly as Luxembourg. A uh, couple of states. Yes, yes, it's close, but not, not, not as bad as Not at that level. Um, and, uh, but ever since this Eurozone, which, by the way, the Euro is uh, a carbon copy of the gold standard of the 1920s. It was created in the image of the gold standard of the 1920s. See, you know what happened to the gold standard of the 1920s. It gave rise to the roaring 20s, to immense financialization, immense concentration of industrial power funded by the consolidation of the financial sector and then Wall Street in 1929. Enormous inequality. Of course, also, enormous yeah. inequality, which is the result of and this uh, easy uh, private money minting by the financial sector. And when the chickens came home to roost in 1929, the common currency of that era, the gold exchange started collapsed, started fragmenting. Very soon, uh, the Germans hated the French, the French hated the Germans, everybody hated the Greeks, and we <laughs> descended into the abyss of the 1930s and 1940s. After our generation's uh, 1929, which took place in 2008, guess what happened? The gold standard started fragmenting, it was called the euro in Europe, and very soon after that, the Germans started pointing moralizing fingers at the Greeks, the Greeks remembered the Nazi occupation, everybody hated the French, and we are now in a state of disintegration where the refugees are the problem. Actually, you should uh, bring up 1953, the London Agreement, of course. which most people don't know about. That's rather critical. Of course. Maybe you want to... But Say let me just answer the complete yeah. story about the euro. How, I'll just tell you the story of how yeah. I found out that oh. the euro group doesn't exist in law. Uh, by the way, one more point. After it, our country it, started to go is failing... Is it inconsistent with European law or just no, it orthogonal doesn't exist in to law. it? It's kind of orthogonal, no connection. It's, 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 it's outside the framework of, the, of European law. Now, does it, do its decisions impact... How do its decisions impact it makes the all the important decisions that determine the future of Europe and every how, single one of them. how are those decisions transmitted to the official decision making bodies to the Brussels bureaucracy oh yes the, what happens is there is the Eurogroup meeting and then afterwards there is an ECOFIN meeting the ECOFIN meeting the ECOFIN does exist it's the meeting of all the European Union uh, finance ministers, including the ones that are not using the euro. So George mm. Osborne from Britain is yeah. there, the Danish finance minister is there. And what happens, it's a rubber stamping process. So whatever the Europe has decided, ECOFIN says, okay, we agree. And, it's and there's never any debate. No, no debate. debate. Yeah. No, no debate. But let, let me tell you, this is quite interesting. How I, I came to understand that this is a paralegal um, group. At some point, um, the Troika inside the Eurogroup because now it's not just the finance ministers, it's the IMF. Lagarde is sitting there, Thompson is sitting there, mm. the European Central Bank is sitting there, the Commission is sitting there, they set the scene, and then the vermin, us, the finance ministers, simply nod. And the IMF, happily. The yeah. IMF has no reaction to the Eurogroup decisions? Well, it's in the Eurogroup. The IMF is part of the Eurogroup. Th so it's astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. So they're represented in the Eurogroup. Well, let me give you an example. When, when the ultimatum was presented to me on the 25th of June, on a take-it-or-leave-it basis, and what that meant was that if I said, no, I'm leaving it, our banks would have been closed as they were five days later. Yeah. Right? So that's a pretty powerful ultimatum. It's like making me an offer that I can't refuse, <laughs> even though we refused it. Uh, <laughs> for a while. 
for a while <laughs> until we caved in and then I resigned. But this is interesting. I was presented with this ultimatum. It comprised three chapters. One was the fiscal policy that we would have to follow for the next 20 years. Interesting. Hmm? It's interesting given that our mandate from the Greek people was only for four and th years. This is spelled out in Spelled out detail. in black and white. Yeah. What the primary surplus could be, what the tax take should be, what, what, what measures should we should use, what the VAT rate should be in order to get that primary surplus. Chapter one. Chapter and two. This is specifically for Greece. Only for Greece. Yeah. Has there been something similar for Spain or yes. Italy? Yes. Yeah. Portugal. Yeah. This colonization is yeah. uh, at full blast. Not just, it started with Greece. All bad things start yeah. with Greece. And, <laughs> and then they spread out. Greece is the laboratory of misanthropy. Now, how do they deal with France? Uh, but France, of course, is the final destination. Yeah. And the but beauty... Is, or is that beginning to give orders to France? Of course. That is. Of course. From the Eurogroup. No, um, the beauty of those five, six months in power. Power, not what power. In, in <laughs> office. Watch, watching, watching power. In <laughs> office. <laughs> <laughs> The beauty of it was, you know, we academics, all our lives, we theorize about things. Okay, we try to get evidence, but we theorize. During that, those five months, I didn't have to theorize. And to answer your question about France, at some point I was having a very interesting conversation. I had many interesting conversations with the uh, finance minister of Germany, Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble. At some point, when I showed him this, this um, ultimatum, and I said to him, it's a, it, it's a long story, but I'll cut it short. I said to him, would you sign this? Just let's take off our hats as finance ministers for a moment. I've been in, in politics for five months. You've been in, in politics for 40 years. You keep barking in my ear that, that I should sign it. Stop telling me what to do. As human beings, you know that my people now are suffering a great depression. We have children at school that faint as a result of malnutrition. Can you just do me the favor and advise me on what to do? Don't tell me what to do. As somebody with 40 years, a Europeanist, somebody who comes from a democratic country, just Wolfgang to Yanis, not finance minister to finance minister. And to his credit, he looked out of the window for a while, and he turned to me and he said, well, the question that I'd actually asked him was, would you sign this? And he turned around and he said, as a patriot, I wouldn't. Of course, the next question was, so why are you forcing me to do it? He said, don't you understand? I did this in the Baltics, in Portugal, in Ireland, you know, we have discipline to look after, and I want to take the Troika to Paris. He said. Yes. So, um, I don't need to theorize. This, it starts with Greece. Greece is a pipsqueak country. It's not that important. But you start with that small problem. You impose these uh, unsustainable loans, which give creditors huge power, and then you start cutting, 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 because the final intention, and I try to explain this in, the, in this book, is to curtail the Parisian elite's long-standing ambition to usurp the power of the Deutsche Mark for yeah. the purposes of expanding the um, French nation-state's uh, reach and for control of Europe. Also, I presume, for the Bundesbank to be able to control the French budget. Absolutely. Not so much, not so much the Bundesbank, but the federal finance minister, the federal Schäuble finance, himself. Yeah. And, and I don't blame the Germans for that. If you, if you go back to 1992, when this euro was first created, the Maastricht Treaty, to convince the French to vote for it, the French conservative newspaper Le Figaro, had a headline that was offensive to human beings. It read, as an encouragement to the French to love the Maastricht Treaty, Maastricht, and underneath, a new Versailles Treaty without a shot being fired. Now, that is offensive to the German people. It is offensive to anyone who understands the pain of the Second World War. It is offensive to all well Intention. And you beings. think French elites actually believe that at yes, Maastricht? Absolutely. absolutely. This is, and this was the intention. Look, the goal. The goal in 1965, in response to a journalist um, who asked him, don't you worry that with this European Economic Union, 
Germany is going to become the powerful country here. And his response was, um, they are going to be the horse, and we are going to be the carriage driver. It's clear. The Brussels bureaucrats. The, well, the French uh, uh, graduates of the of great the uh, Grand Ecole, yeah. uh, who would be populating the, the Brussels bureaucracy. So we um, should not be anti-German, anti-French, or any, we just must understand that the elites of Europe have made a complete and utter mess of the project of European Union. Yeah, but when you get to Maastricht, the French elites still believe that they were controlling German power in the Maastricht Treaty? Yes. That's pretty astonishing. It is, it, 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 it's, it, it's an astonishing error on their part. Mm. But so was the German elite's uh, estimation that Helmut Kohl, for instance, who was a Europeanist, who was a Federalist deep down, that you create a currency union first, and then when it gets in trouble, the political we'll union will, will follow. We'll follow. What an error. When you create a gold standard and it starts fragmenting, you're not going to end up with a political union. You're going to end up with a, uh, an abyss. You're going to end up with Le Pen in government in France, Golden Dawn so, in Greece, the IFD in Germany, so and the fragmentation. You think he understood, say, Nicholas Caldor's uh, prediction? He never did. Never? No, none of them did. Including Cole? Including Cole. He didn't yeah. understand it and he didn't believe it. He really genuinely thought in a rather simple-minded manner that we are creating this monetary union, its fragmentation is going to bring about humongous costs for Europeans, so our successors, when this fragmentation begins, must fix it by creating a political union. Well, yes, they must, but they're not doing it. And they're not doing it because they are falling prey to this um, self-reinforcing negative feedback mechanism between authoritarianism and bad austerity policies. How did the uh, Fed respond to Maastricht? The Fed? Yeah. It is interesting. Um, remember, Alan Greenspan was not the most astute of central bankers. <laughs> <laughs> and he was in some ways. He understood why the economy was working so well. Remember his testimony to Congress where he explained uh, how magnificent the economy was that he was administering. <laughs> he said it's based on growing worker insecurity. True. That's, that was a good remark. Yeah. Yes, yes, so he was a real class warrior, yeah. but he did not understand finance. Yeah. Yeah? Unlike Paul Volcker but, who but did. He un but he understood power. Yes, he understood power, but Paul Volcker, yeah, his predecessor, true. understood both power and the pitfalls of over-reliance on markets. Yeah, okay, so what was the reaction to Maastricht by the Fed? None. None? None. It was... Um, they didn't pay attention? There no. was... Well, I do not know of any substantial reaction. I haven't seen any. I've done some research. They were just going along. They would be making comments about the specific technicalities. Mm -hmm. But not any... Degree, um, uh, uh, Paul Volcker did make some very what, interesting what comments. It, what was his oh, reaction? He was very critical. He was very critical of the lack of checks and balances and shock-absorbing mechanisms. Mm -hmm. uh, but Alan Greenspan and the Fed under Alan Greenspan... Um, indulged in auto-lobotomy regarding these structural aspects of uh, global capitalism. Actually, you ought to bring up what the 1953 yes. story. That's quite critical. Well, it's part of a broader story of uh, American hegemony yeah. after the Second World War, yeah. which has two dimensions that are, of course, uh, um, interwoven. One is the Cold War story, which is a very important story, and the increasing authoritarianism of the United States after, after Truman. Yeah. Uh, beginning with the, the Truman Doctrine, again Greece, remember, everything bad starts in Greece, like the Cold War, which began in the streets of Athens in December 1944, not in Berlin, then spread to Berlin, uh, with, the, with the first attempts by the CIA, successful attempts, to overthrow uh, governments that they considered inimical to the interests of the global empire, uh, like uh, the Mossadegh government, then later our government. I grew up in the dictatorship that the CIA managed to create before the Pentagon had its own coup with the generals. They yeah. felt, you know, there was a, a wonderful race between the Pentagon on the one hand and uh, the CIA as to who was going to stage the Greek coup in 1967 first. 
and they were working quite separately from one another. The Pentagon with generals and the king, and the CIA with the colonels, and the colonels got in first. They were more agile, so they moved in first. And so then you had Pinochet, you have the Latin American uh, uh, brutality, and so on. So that's one story we all know about American imperialism post-1944. But the, the second dimension, which is much more interesting and much more benign, because if you look at, it starts with Bretton Woods, an attempt to prevent by the new dealers in power, and by some very good people, to prevent another Great Depression in the States. Yeah. The great fear, of course, was in 1944, they could see that the war would end, they could see that the wonderful factories that were churning out the aircraft carriers, the tanks, the bullets, the jeeps, and so on, uh, even if they were reconfigured to produce white goods and cars and consumer durables, there would not be sufficient demand within America for all those products that these factories could potentially make. So that if, eventually, they would scale down investment at a time when the American GIs, the American soldiers, would be coming back from the front, and that would spear... And they, 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 feared, they, they called it the, the 1949 moment. They feared that in 1949, it's 20 years fam- after 1929, there would be another crash. Famous dollar gap. Exactly. Yeah. So they sat down and designed a magnificent global plan to prevent this from happening. They also knew that there was a Cold War, of course, there was the, uh, the, 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 the pressing agenda of making sure that Europe doesn't fall to the communists and Asia doesn't fall to the communists. So the two dimensions were combined and the global plan of which the Bretton Woods system was just one part entailed, just to put it as succinctly as I can, the following characteristics and dimensions. Europe would be dollarized so that uh, Europeans could buy the gleaming cars and the gleaming, gleaming aircra- aircraft and washing machines from Westinghouse and so on and so forth, that America would not be able to absorb on American soil. Uh, Europeans were in ashes after the war, so they needed to be dollarized. So they would be allowed to recreate on their own currencies, but their currencies would be pegged to the dollar. Effectively, they would have the dollar uh, in different form. And that was a fixed exchange rate regime. It's very similar to the gold exchange standard, yeah. but with a very big difference. The New Dealers, who had felt the Great Depression in their bones, most of them, if you look at their biography, had actually suffered during the Great Depression, and they were very keen to avoid it again, understood that what was missing in the gold exchange standard was a system of surplus recycling, of taking surpluses surpluses from jurisdictions where they were being created through a political mechanism and siphoning them in the form of productive investments or some kind of investment into the deficit areas in order to be able to generate the incomes in the deficit areas that were necessary to keep purchasing stuff from the surplus countries so the surplus countries could remain surplus countries, like America, for instance, to keep recycling surpluses and deficits to maintain this global plan. Uh, if you think about the new, an extension, this was an extension yeah, of the New Deal. You know, it's worth uh, bringing out the role of reconstructing Germany of course. In, in this system, which was quite critical. I have looked at Senate uh, papers mm-hmm. from 1946 talking exactly about that, because this global, global plan uh, had to rely on a European pillar and on an Asian pillar. And they had to have um, a strong European currency and a strong Asian currency to act as shock absorbers. I, there are these amazing documents where they say, okay, uh, American capitalism is going to go through a spasm like capitalism always does. That shows a kind of understanding that today, on the last 20 years, is absent from mm-hmm. policymakers. So they could see that there would be a recession. And the question they were asking, if we only have one currency after the war because Europe was destroyed and we would be dollarizing them, if we only had the dollar, any crisis in the dollar zone in America would be, be transmitted very quickly both to Asia and Europe, and maybe those shocks would be um, magnified instead of being dampened. So we need shock absorbers. We need the European currency and the, and the Asian currency that would do the shock absorbing. So, but in order for those currencies to be sufficiently strong, they would have to have they'd have to be an support, industry. And they'd an also industry. Have to, and crucially subordinate to the dollar. Not, subordinate? Not Kansas. Proposal. Exactly, exactly. But they would have, so they would have to be net exporters in their vicinity. 
Yes. But so Germany but, in the rest of Europe, yeah, but within, Japan vis a vis China. Yeah, within the global system managed in and Washington. And within the global system um, under the tutel. And the that's the Keynes White. Dispute exactly, the Battle of Bretton Woods, yeah, which yeah. is an amazing episode yeah. in intellectual and financial yeah. history. Uh, now, at that point, the, the problem they had when they were thinking about this in 1946, late 45, early 46, was that they already had agreed with the French to turn Germany into a pastoral land, to deindustrialize Germany. So they had to go back to the French and say, um, we changed our minds. And they did. And they offered them uh, a bargain. You will agree to the reindustrialization of Germany. You will agree to a write down of German debt, otherwise, the German economy will never be able to recover if it is in the dark cloud of unsustainable debt. And in, st and in uh, um, return, what we're going to give you is the leadership of Europe. This is the, the De Gaulle idea that they are the drivers of the carriage and Germany is the horse that powers it. And indeed, this is what happened. If you think of the, the, where is the OECD? It's in Paris. What is the OECD? The OECD is a relic of the Marshall Plan. So the French were distributing Marshall aid in Europe. Uh, think about Brussels. Brussels was completely and utterly designed by the French elites. Yeah. Think about the IMF. Why is uh, Christine Lagarde the managing director of the IMF? Why was Troscan the man? This is still the relic if you want the, 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 the leftover of this deal with the French and the Germans. Interestingly, so going to 53, 53 is where the Americans grabbed the heads of the British, of the French, of the Italians, and of the Greeks, in, in, incidentally, and, and, and banked them together and said, you are going to, 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 to write down German debt. So um, Greece was owed money by Germany that it throwed off so that Germany could uh, reindustrialize in the 1950s. And that illustrates the title of your book. The French got something in return. The Greeks didn't. The weak suffer as they must. Uh, it, it, yes, indeed. Uh, but of course, I always like to leave a degree of optimism hanging in me there. <laughs> so you may have noticed that my book ends with, the title ends with a question mark. And the emphasis is on the question mark. And the dedication is to my mother, and it says that my mother would have slaughtered with immense kindness anyone who dared say that the weak suffer what they must. And even the original um, expression comes from Thucydides in the history of the Peloponnesian War, when he recounts as an Athenian, remember Thucydides is an Athenian historian and soldier and general, who is recounting the story of when Athens sent a fleet with troops, the marines, the Athenian marines to the island of Milos to crush the local society, the local city-state. Why? Because Milos refused to take sides in the Cold War, or actually the hot war of the time, between Athens and Sparta. And Athens had a, a, its own NATO in the archipelago of the Aegean, and it was very worried that if the millions are allowed to be independent, then the rest might get ideas that they want to exit NATO the NATO of the time. So they sent the troops to crush them. And there is this interesting meeting when the Athenian generals meet the, um, the million representatives, delegates, to announce to them that, you know, your life is over, surrender quietly, and we will sell you as slaves. If you resist, we are going to crush you. And the millions gave them a Kantian argument that uh, you should never treat human beings as uh, an end, uh, a means to an end, you should treat them as uh, ends in themselves. Not exactly, they, but they more or less read, this. They hadn't read Kant yet. <laughs> <laughs> of course, but it was more or less that kind of Kantian yeah. argument. You should treat the, those in a position of weakness in the, in the same way you would want to be treated in a position of weakness, uh, because one day you will be in a position of weakness, as the Athenians, of course, did become Very shortly soon. afterwards when they lost the war to Sparta. And the Athenian general responded, no, you've got it this wrong. The strong do what they can, and the weak suffer what they must. But Thucydides is telling us this story in order to allow us to criticize it. That's the question mark. Well, the, I think the, uh, the real optimistic com uh, element in the book is the uh, Condorcet quote about power really being in the hands of the masses, if they take it. In the mind of the masses. In the mind. And in fact, that goes back to 
And he was probably quoting David Hume, who in the uh, uh, First Principles of Government uh, makes that point very clearly. He says, uh, he says it's surprising to see the easiness with which the, um, the great mass of the population is subordinate to their governors because power is in the hands of the governed. And if we inquire into the means by which this wonder is achieved, we see that it is by consent alone that the powerful are able to govern. Meaning if the governed refuse to consent, to that's use exactly your right. words, the game is over. That's exactly right. And I and Lanai, my wife, we felt that uh, on the 3rd of July last year. There was a magnificent moment. Because you've got to remember, we, our government uh, won the election in January 2015 with a mandate to speak truth to the powerful, to say no to them. And do your worst. We're not accepting any more of your toxic loans. Uh, under conditions that will shrink our economy and our, and our people further. Uh, and we won this election, but because of the system of uh, disproportional representation, we won government with 36% of the vote. The, next, the, uh, the, the, the previous governing party received some like 25%, so we, were, we had enough seats in parliament to form a government. But that's 36% of the vote. And we had the whole media of Greece and the world completely and utterly militantly against us. We had the central bank. Third day I was in, the, in, in my office. The president of the Eurogroup visited me to say, either you accept the existing policies, the ones we were, challenge, we were elected to challenge, or your banks will be closed within a month. So we, this, this is the, you can't be weaker than that. <laughs> we did have a strategy. We did have a secret weapon. We can talk about this later when we open this up. But when they closed their banks down, uh, I believed that it was just a matter of days before our support would wane. And we had called for a referendum to support us to carry on fighting. So remember, we had only won 36%. The banks were closed. People didn't have access to their money. Pensioners were fainting in line in front of closed banks to get some money out in order to feed themselves. The, the press is uh, bombarding, terrorizing people in their living rooms on the television set, saying to them that if they vote with us against the Troika, Armageddon is going to come and will be expelled from the universe, not just for Europe. Uh, <laughs> and those crazy, magnificent Greeks gave us 62%. Why? Because the one deficit that they could not bear was the deficit of dignity. And they had a Condorcet moment. So, uh, what happens to Greece now? Well, unfortunately, that very night of the referendum, yeah. uh, our government, my Prime Minister, Collapsed. surrendered. But now, and that, well, to, to answer your question, that surrender meant that we have the worst of the co possible combination. We have a neoliberal ideology with completely anti neoliberal policies. They increased the, the corporate harsh, tax rate, harsher they conditions. increased the VAT rate, they increased the income tax rate, they reduced pensions, they reduced wages. So they did even harsher conditions even than the ones you refused. The Greek economy is fading. All business plans are going haywire. Uh, in a sense, remember liquidate, liquidate, liquidate under President Hoover? Mellon, mm -hmm. I think that was the name of the U.S. Treasury Secretary mm -hmm. that said that. Yes. This is what's happening. Complete liquidation of Greek business, the Greek state, and the Greek people. And all that is happening in the context of a 19th century gunboat diplomacy, the purpose of which is not so much Greece. It is how to keep France, Spain, Portugal. After my prime minister's uh, uh, surrender on the 13th of July, he signed the document of surrender. And you know what happened? The Spanish right-wing prime minister came out of the room, wielding this document like this, in front of the cameras. And speaking in Spanish to the Spanish media, he said, 
This is what you get if you vote for the Syriza of Spain, Podemos. Podemos, yeah. Well, thankfully, the Spanish people booted him out, but didn't vote for Podemos in. So now have a hung parliament in Spain, no government. No government. Yeah. Well, actually, that's much better than having that government. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So what do you think the future is for the uh, peripheral country? When you say liquidate, does that mean liquidate into German hands primarily? No, what I mean is, they have, what's going to happen is we're going to have hundreds of thousands of small business, Who's buying petit bourgeois up? people who will lose their shops, who will lose their pharmacies, uh, they will be uh, a lost generation, they'll become homeless, they will leave the country, their kids who are well, well educated will go to Germany, they will go to Spain, no, because the Spaniards are leaving. They will come here, they will go to Canada, they will go to Australia, they will go to South America, somewhere to find a way of making ends meet. Um, you're going to have the liquidation of households with foreclosures, and, uh, and, and foreclosures in Greece are worse than here, because here you can take the keys to your house and go to the bank and say, take it, buy. In Greece you can't do that. Even if you lose your house, you still have the debt. You carry it with you, like Mephistopheles walking around with hell around him. You're walking around the world with that same debt, even though you have no house. It's kind of like student debt here. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, in answer to your question, what is now the prospect of progressive politics and of hope in Greece? I think that now we had a window of opportunity in Greece to reboot this loan agreement and to reboot Europe, because had we succeeded there, uh, then it, was, it would have really spread to Spain and to Italy and to the, other, the rest of Europe. Yeah. We missed that. This is why I and some other uh, utopians and recalcitrants throughout Europe, we have, we've created what we call DiEM, the right. Democracy in Europe movement, with our manifesto that Noam Chomsky signed, <laughs> making me the happiest person in Europe. <laughs> For a very simple reason. I think we are in a 1930 moment. Shortly after the collapse of Wall Street, the great financial crisis, and just before the slide into a postmodern abyss of uh, xenophobia, misanthropy, failed economic policies, austerity, debt deflation, that will become a major source of uncertainty, of misanthropy, of pain, and unnecessary pain, not just for Europe, but for the rest of the world. And Allow me, at this point, I have a pin that I've brought with me oh. for Diem to give to you, which I'm wearing. And this is a bit of propaganda for our democracy in Europe movement. <laughs> uh, I can't not give this to Noam Chomsky since he signed our manifesto. Thank you very much. <laughs> And I'm, I'm being signaled to that we have to open this up. It's a good point. Q &A. It's a good point. <laughs> we... It's good to end with a pin. So we're, we're, we're going to put uh, a microphone here. And I, I see a pin that you can take. So... That's great. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Chomsky, Mr. Chomsky, Mr. Varoufakis. My question is about European integration policy, the, the then and now. Um, we know that uh, in 1992, the leaders of the day signed the Maastricht Treaty, which uh, stipulated those convergence criteria to measure, uh, well, uh, I guess, similarity between economies, such that if they were able to fulfill those criteria, they qualified for the initial round of Euro membership. Are EU policymakers only looking at those uh, criteria now, those de deficit uh, criteria, or are they looking at other measures of integration, given what we know about what's... Uh, are looking at, are they, is that their only policy focus? Our, our well, criteria. let me say that they never looked at those criteria. Those okay. were bogus criteria. Greece didn't meet those criteria. Italy didn't meet those criteria. Far from it. The criterion was 60% of debt over GDP as a maximum. Italy had 100%. But, of course, the whole point of creating the Eurozone was in order to stop fiat producing cars that would be, remain competitive vis-a-vis -vis Volkswagens through devaluation of the lira. So they needed Italy. So they, they violated their own criteria. They just ignored them. And they brought Italy Greece. And you know how Greece got in? 
We had some smart people in the finance ministry in the, bank, in the Central Bank of Greece, and they copied exactly the same tricks that they used in it to let Italy in. And they said, well, we know what you've been up to, so if you let Italy in, we were doing the same tricks, we will present the same data, so either you have to kick the Italians out or allow us in as well. So this is how we got caught up. Uh, you've got to understand that it's a very um, hypocritical concept, the whole thing, the whole process. So there was never a question of integration, really. There was a question of expanding the limits of um, uh, predatory financialization. Uh, Frank, what, what, what did Greece have to offer the Eurozone? Can I tell you what we had? We had no oil. We had really, I mean, we were not a traditional colony that had natural resources to be. What we brought to the Eurozone was um, a population with minimal debt and a lot of equity because Greeks loathed debt. My parents' generation didn't have credit cards, personal loans, mortgages. They worked for 30 years, put some money aside, borrowed some money from an aunt or an uncle and bought a house. Okay? So we were a dream come true for German and French bankers. We had a, a, a Protestant almost ethic in terms of indebtedness, very low debt, and a capacity once extended, once the Deutschmark was extended to, to Greece. Okay? We had the capacity to borrow and borrow and borrow on the basis of very sound collateral. Um, so this edifice was never designed to sustain an economic crisis. Do you know which are, were the two countries that violated the Maastricht criteria first, before anybody else? Germany and France. France yeah. huh? So these rules were written not to be respected, but were written to be used as a club by which to beat the weak and the ones who dare speak out against the irrationality of the system. Mm -hmm. okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Um, my question is for Mr. Chomsky. In the past, you've been very critical of the way in which the West has engaged in political and economic imperialism around the world behind closed doors, kind of smoke and mirrors. Um, how do you believe that transparency and democratizing the Eurozone will affect or deter this behavior? With the transparency in... And democratizing the Eurozone. And democratizing the Eurozone. How will it kind of affect or well, possibly uh, deter this behavior? Actually, one of the things that uh, Giannis discusses in his book is uh, that the Eurozone, in the Eurozone, democracy has declined arguably even faster than it has in the United States. Uh, during this past generation uh, of neoliberal policies, there has been a global assault on democracy. That's kind of inherent in the principles. And in the Eurozone, it's reached a remarkable level. I mean, even uh, the Wall Street Journal, you know, hardly a critical rag, uh, pointed out that uh, no matter who gets elected in a European country, whether it's communists, fascists, anybody else, the policies remain the same. And the reason is they're all set in Brussels by the uh, bureaucracy. And the uh, citizens of the national states have no role in this. And when they try to have a role, as in the Greek referendum, they get smashed down. Uh, that's a rare step. Mostly they are sitting by passively as victims of policies over which they have nothing to say. And uh, what uh, Yana said about the Eurogroup is quite striking. This is a completely unelected work group, not in any remote way related to citizens' decisions, but it's basically making the decision, the choices and decisions. That's even beyond what happens here. Here it's bad enough, but that's more extreme. Well, let me add to this, uh, yes. just to clarify something. Actually, I will go further than Noam about Europe. Uh, Europe is, the European Union doesn't suffer, or the Eurogroup, from a democratic deficit. It's like saying that we are on the moon and there is an oxygen deficit. There is no oxygen deficit on the moon. There is no oxygen. Full stop. <laughs> and this is official in Europe. In my first Eurogroup, as the rookie around, I was given the floor to set out our policies and to introduce myself. 
which is nice. And I gave the most moderate speech that I thought it was humanly possible to make. I said, I know that you are annoyed I'm here. Uh, your favorite guy didn't get elected. I got elected. I'm here. But I'm here in order to work with you, to find common ground. Uh, there is a failed program that you, you, want, you, that you want to keep insisting on, on, on implementing in Greece. We have our mandate. Let's sit down and find common ground. I thought that that was a pretty moderate thing to say. They didn't. Um, and then after me, after I had expounded the principle of continuity and the principle of democracy and the idea of having some compromise between the two, um, Dr. Wolfgang Schäuble puts his name tag forward and demands the floor. And he comes up with a magnificent statement. Verbatim, I'm going to give you what he said. Elections cannot be allowed to change the economic policies of any country. <laughs> At which point I intervened and I said, this is the greatest gift to the Communist Party of China, because they believe that too. <laughs> okay? Now, while I was in there, in the 12 Eurogroup meetings that I attended, before I resigned, I noticed in those very lengthy, incredibly intense and depressing sequences of discussions, some of them lasted more than 12 hours, the room was full of cameras, microphones. You know, these screens, we had 30 of them. I could say, whoever, you know, we were in the same room with people and I was watching them on television because, you know, this is the power of the screen. You don't watch the person speaking, you watch him on the screen or her. Yeah? And at some point it hit me. We don't need a revolution here. Somebody in the control booth just press a button and connect all these cameras to the internet. Just imagine if that would have to happen. Eh? You don't need a treaty change, a new constitution, a revolution, nothing. Somebody just press a button. Like in a science fiction movie, you press a button and suddenly you have a new universe. Eh? What would happen? Would Schäuble say this? I don't know, maybe he would, but it, you know what? It would make a difference for the Germans, the French, the Portuguese, the Greeks to hear him say those words. Instead of reading the Financial Times, where people like Peter Spiegel were simply saying that Yanis Varoufakis was resisting reform in his country and he demanded more money for it. Huh? So transparency is everything. We need, this is the first step. It's a huge revolutionary step that takes nothing more than the press of a button. So the, this is why you know, on our side, again, I'm a salesperson here tonight, in dim25.org, there is a Transparency in Europe Now campaign. We are demanding the live streaming of all these uh, uh, meetings. We are demanding that the ECB publishes in minutes. We are demanding <laughs> that all the TTIP negotiating... Do you know that as the Minister of State for Finance in Greece, in order to look at the TTIP documents of the negotiations between the European Union, to which I was a, a finance minister, and the United States, I had to sign a non-disclosure agreement. I had, in other words, the price of looking at those documents was that I promised not to tell my electorate. So, if you can, get into our site and sign the petition for transparency. It's a small step, just to make it difficult for them. Even if they have to answer the question, why are they not live streaming the meetings? That's a small step, because you're putting them in a difficult position. I just want to say that we are also live streaming. <laughs> and that I'm not going to tell you how many questions we're going to take, but we're going to end at 8.59. So go, next question. Thank you. 59. <laughs> you and your precision. <laughs> 901. Okay, hi. Um, it's a little bit a uh, follow-up question to the previous one, um, to Varoufakis. I'm wondering, you wrote that um, Wolfgang Schäuble wants to kind of have a super minister of all of the Eurozone, uh, an unelected one who will just kind of decide on national budgets, that's his plan. Um, but I'm just wondering, what, is, uh, what would you propose uh, instead? Because sometimes it's a bit unclear to me if you also want kind of a super minister, just elected one, or if you want more... Uh, uh, power of the budget uh, put, taken back to the national countries. Uh, and also... Um, what, a second question? Hmm? Just, oh, yeah. just one <laughs> no, question. No, no, and, but, but also the, just uh, the Eurozone, uh, if, you, if you want to keep the Euro in, in the long term, or if it should be maybe slowly... Okay, it's uh, the same, same yes, question. Yeah, same okay, let me, let me be brief. What Schäuble wants, and I know that because he's written about it, we've discussed it, is 
uh, a, a, a semblance of federation, where the Eurogroup becomes, a, he, he doesn't feel good that it's not legal. He wants to legalize it. And he wants to turn the president of the Eurogroup into the fiscal leviathan of the Eurozone. He doesn't call him that. He wants him to be, if you want, the, the fiscal uh, representative of, or treasurer, the treasurer of the Eurozone. But he wants to give this person a tiny little budget, tiny federal budget, 1% of GDP, nothing in other words. And the main function for this person will be to have a veto power over national budgets. Mm -hmm. Now, this is a monstrous notion. Let me give you an example. On the one hand, you have a parliament, the French National Assembly, voting in a budget. Okay? The budget of, uh, uh, of the French government is 50% of GDP. Half of the economy of France is controlled by the state. Okay? And now you're going to have a fiscal overlord in Europe that has a 1% budget. In other words, has absolutely no capacity to affect surplus recycling within Europe and stabilize European capitalism. But he is going to have, uh, I was going to say he or she, but we know it's going to be a he, don't we? Uh, he is going to have the right to veto the budget that the National Assembly of France voted. And why? In order to keep countries within the fiscal constraints of the Maastricht Treaty, which has, which has so abundantly and spectacularly failed. And let me give you an example of why this is just mad. And it makes absolutely no sense, even from a neoliberal perspective. Take Ireland. Ireland, before 2008, was the blue-eyed boy or girl of the international neoliberal Washington consensus. They had turned their markets so elastic that they, you know, they resembled the circus. Uh, they had a debt-to-GDP ratio of 25%, half that of Germany. They were never above budget. They had a surplus. Actually, they had a surplus in their the equivalent of their federal budget, right, or their state budget. So they were the model country, the model citizen of the neoliberal mantra. Okay? Now, of course, if you look at what was happening in the private sector, they had gone crazy with, you know, they, they, there was a frenzy of indebtedness, like here in Wall Street and so on and so forth. The moment the credit crunch began after Lehman Brothers, the developers went bust, the developers' loans to the Anglo-Irish Bank and the various other uh, shady banks in Ireland uh, went bad. They became non-performing. Those banks immediately became insolvent. And then the president of the central bank, a certain Mr. Jean-Claude Trichet, called the, the, the Irish prime minister and said, accept, transfer all the losses of the private sector onto the public books, onto the taxpayers, uh, or else, or I will close down your banks. Remember that happened to me a few years later too. Huh? <laughs> and at that point, suddenly, Irish public debt went from 25% to 120%. Now, what would the fiscal overlord do then? Nothing. Would he veto this? No, because it was the central bank's direct directive that pushed all the losses of the private sector onto the taxpayers. So, this system that Dr. Schreiber is, is, is proposing is just um, an attempt to legitimize the illegitimate current informal system. Uh, it has absolutely no capacity to stabilize European capitalism. The only thing it will do, it will formalize the current impasse. You're asking me what I want. I would like a federal democracy. I would like a European parliament. I would like a federal government with a substantial budget, with proper, proper surplus, surplus recycling, and I would like to have a European Union constitution that is 15, 20 pages, and not written by a, fo a failed former uh, president of France that, 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 that scripts the preface that happened in 2005, beginning with the rights of capital. <laughs> you knew that, didn't you? That, the, 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 there was an attempt to write the European Union constitution, which began, began the preface, the Bill of Rights, was all about the rights of capital. This is, this is you can't make That's it up, can you? Schäuble, <laughs> Schäuble's comment about elections. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to be here in front of both of you. I wanted to ask a quick, a quick question of, uh, for Yanis. Uh, to what extent do you uh, agree with the notion that 
the Greek government was caught in a tragic uh, circumstance and they did what their options allowed them to do at the time, given that the other option might have been an exit from the euro combined with the refugee crisis that they have now. And for uh, Mr. Chomsky, I wanted to ask a little bit your evaluation on the uh, Bernie Sanders phenomenon in, in American politics and how do you evaluate that for the future of American politics? Well, sorry, the, I said the, Bernie the, Sanders. The Sanders phenomenon. Oh, Sanders. Bernie. Yeah. You, you start with Bernie. Well, Bernie Sanders is an extremely interesting phenomenon. He's a decent, honest person. That's pretty unusual in the political system. Uh, maybe there are two of them in the world. But he's considered uh, a radical and extremist, which is a pretty interesting characterization. Uh, because he's basically a mainstream New Deal Democrat. His positions uh, would not have surprised President Eisenhower, who said, in fact, that uh, anyone who does not accept New Deal programs doesn't belong in the American political system. Uh, that's now considered very radical. Uh, the other interesting aspect of Sanders' positions is that they're quite strongly supported by the general public and have been for a long time. Uh, it's true on taxes, it's true on health care. Uh, so take, say, health care. Uh, his, his proposal for a national health care system, meaning the kind of system that just about every other developed country has uh, at uh, half the per capita cost of the United States and uh, comparable or better outcomes, uh, that's considered very radical. But it's been the position of the majority of the American population for a long time. So if you go back, say, to the Reagan, right now, for example, uh, latest polls, about 60% of the population favor it. Uh, when Obama put through the Affordable Care Act, there was, you recall, a public option, but that was dropped. It was dropped even though it was supported by about almost two-thirds of the population. They go back earlier, say, to the Reagan years, uh, about 70% of the population thought that national health care should be in the Constitution because it's such an obvious right. And in fact, about 40% of the population thought it was in the Constitution, <laughs> again, because it's such an obvious right. And, and the same is true on tax policy and others. So we have this phenomenon where someone is taking positions that would have been considered pretty mainstream uh, during the Eisenhower years, that are supported by uh, a large part, often a considerable majority of the population, uh, but he's dismissed as radical and extremist. Uh, that's an indication of how the spectrum has shifted to the right during the neoliberal period. Uh, so far to the right that the d contemporary Democrats are pretty much what used to be called moderate Republicans, and the Republicans are just off the spectrum. They're not a legitimate parliamentary party anymore. And Sanders has uh, uh, the, the significant part of He has pressed the mainstream Democrats a little bit towards the progressive side. You see that in... Clinton statements, but he has mobilized a large number of young people, these young people who are saying, look, we're not going to consent anymore. And if that turns into a, a, a continuing, organized, mobilized, mobilized force, that could change the country, maybe not for this election, but in the longer term. I'm going to answer your question by saying, um, and I hope you don't consider this to be too harsh a judgment of your question. I will say that embedded in your question is the most to toxic form of Tina, of, that, of the proposition that there is no alternative. The idea that in the end we had to surrender because the alternative would be worse, or worse effectively denigrates 
the 62% of Greeks who ordered us not to surrender. And it denigrates those of us who actually want government. Because if what you're saying is right, we were naive. We walked in there and we thought that with the power of, our, of rationality and the force of our personality, we would convince the Troika of lenders to be kind to us. That we would rely on the kind and kindness of creditors. No, we were not naive. From 2012 to 2013, I had long conversations with uh, our team, the, gov the, the team that in eventually became the uh, negotiating team, the government, the inner cabinet, the war cabinet, as we called it. And we were talking about how are we going to respond to the threat of bank closures that would happen on the first day of our government. And we had worked out a plan of, of what our retaliation would be. I won't bore you now, we don't have the time. Um, I've sp spoken about this extensively. We would have to haircut the bonds that the ECB held that were in Greek law. It was perfectly simple to do it. We would not end up as Argentina because it was Greek law. The ECB would have to come to a Greek court to contest it. They would not be dragging us to Luxembourg, to London, or to New York. And that would have crippled QE. It would have brought down, with a very high probability, the euro. So if they closed down our banks, we had a, a weapon by which to retaliate. We were planning a parallel payment system in case the banking system uh, was in disrepair and could not be used for transaction. We had that agreement. It's the only reason why I stood in front of the Greek people and I asked them to vote me in. The, I didn't ask them to do this in order for me to go in there and go into the Eurogroup and, and give nice speeches and hope for the best. And we did not see this through. To say that it was inevitable that we would surrender and that the, the alternative would be uh, worse is effectively to confirm that there is no alternative to barbarism. And I just have not confirmed this. May I, may I, if, if, if this would be okay for you, may I suggest that we take, we bundle three questions together. And so you ask three brief questions, maybe. Not one of you. You ask one. You ask one question, you ask one question, and the gentleman there asks one question. And the others who are there, I, I applaud you for being so hopeful. Okay. Thank, Just one after thank you very much for this conversation. And I would like to ask my question to both of you. Uh, you have discussed the situation in Spain, and we have just found today that after four months without being able to form a government, there will be new general elections on the 26th of June. So my question would be, which would be your message in this critical juncture in the battle of ideas in Europe for the Spanish people and also for Podemos? Thank you. Question number one. Question number two. Yes, thank you for a fascinating evening. Austerity is bankrupt. It's bankrupt empirically. It's bankrupt intellectually. It continues to be imposed on the people of Europe. You have framed this tonight as primarily a political conflict, primarily between Germany and France. Can't we interpret this as an agenda by people who have no particular political or, or national uh, allegiances to impose Reagan and Thatcher style uh, a capitalism on the core of Europe, including Germany. What happens to German pensions at the end of this game? And the last question. My question was uh, concerning some of the other peripheral countries in Europe, Ireland, Spain, and Italy, and their national governments did not support you last year during the crisis. Uh, now, would you comment on that? And also, what do you think the prospects for those countries are now, economically? Well, the uh, message for the people of Spain, I think, should be this. That's what they should be voting for. And they can achieve it. Uh, I go back to David Hume, a power is in the hands of the people if they don't consent. And that's critical. I have nothing to add to this. Uh, I'll try to combine it with the last question, because what applies to the people of Spain applies to the people of Italy, to the people of France, but indeed also to the people of Germany. And that brings us to the other question as well. We're in it, in it together. The notion that Europe is split between North and South and the north is populated by all the ants, whereas the grasshoppers have congregated to the south and to Ireland, is a very strange and odd idea. 
There are ants and there are grass grasshoppers everywhere. What happened before 2008 was the grasshoppers of the south and the grasshoppers of the north got together into a splendid alliance of um, um, debt-driven frenzy. They were the bankers, they were the uh, spivs, they were those who uh, predicated their growth on uh, uh, transfers from the European Union budget to create motorways that went to nowhere, Olympic game sites in Greece, and so on and so forth, and they became fabulously rich. This, this, this was the alliance of the grasshoppers. The, the ants were working very hard and were finding it very hard to make ends meet during the good times. And then when the grasshoppers empire collapsed, it was the ants of the north and the ants of the south that had to bail them out. And it's time for the ants of the north and the ants of the south to unite in Europe to change that crazy regi regime. Final words? Yeah, I think. I want to pay my respects to this institution. <laughs> and I want to thank you and your staff. I met some of them before for the diligence and the dedication and the enthusiasm. Uh, if only our rulers had a modicum, a modicum, a percentage, a small percentage of this uh, dedication to public service, Continue. the world would have been a much better Continue place. Continue a little more. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.